If you ever saw the movie Lawrence of Arabia, there's a scene in there where Lawrence is arguing with the Omar Sharif character, and Lawrence says, nothing is written. Because the, the character, the Bedouin, saying, our history is written. It's inevitable. We can't do that. Lawrence says, nothing is written. And it's so true because history is made by people making decisions. And as we make decisions in our lives, we step onto a stage of history where we deal with challenges and have opportunities. Fortunately for us today and our children and grandchildren and their grandchildren, Wendell staff had a decision to make. Do they try to save this or tear it down? There was nothing in between. Either you do it all or you do nothing and it's gone forever. They said, let's make it a priority. The city council had to make a decision. A lot of needs in this city. A decision, though, to reinvest in something important to us. The people of Oklahoma City had a decision to make on a bond issue. Do we reinvest in ourselves and in quality of life? Yes. It was those decisions stacked one upon another that brought us here today. Well, let me back up with the string of decisions connecting the dots from the very beginning. Oklahoma City started growing at a miraculous rate in 1898. Many of you have heard me give those speeches. We would go from 4,000 people in 1898, a town smaller than Perry, Oklahoma today, to 64,000 people by 1910, the state capital, starting this fabulous growth in the story of Oklahoma City. Well, it was critical that the city got off on the, wrong, the right foot. Fortunately for us, this was the age called the Progressive Era, when people were concerned about outdoor recreation, of beauty. This is the age of the national park system coming to life. This is the age of city parks across the country, from St. Louis to New York to San Francisco. It's a time when people were worried about their environment, the John Muirs of the world. Well, we had John Muir people in Oklahoma City. He says, we have to make sure we have a beautiful place to live and think about quality of life. People like Anton Klassen, when he would develop a neighborhood, he would plant two trees in every front yard and one tree in the back. For 27 years, I lived in, one of Mr. In, a, in a house in one of his neighborhoods where he had planted two sycamores and a pecan in the back. I am Putnam, after whom Putnam City is named as he developed starting in downtown Oklahoma City in 1907 and 198 would plant trees and bushes and build boulevarded streets. They were concerned about it. Well, the city was part of that. And I think Ed Lichen actually started working for the city in 1904 as the quote, city florist. The city, the people of this city felt that beauty was important enough that they had a city florist. And it was young Ed. And in 1907, they followed with the first conservatory built at the old Wheeler Park that was down on the river. From 1889 uh, to 1907, when people wanted recreation, they would go down to the river. That became Wheeler Park. And Wheeler Park was the spot where they built the first zoo. It's where they had outdoor recreation. You'd have other commercial places in town, like Delmer Garden, eventually Belle Isle, to the north in 1907, 1908. But Wheeler Park was the park. But people believed in parks and in beauty. And in 1909, the people of this city passed a bond issue to buy the right of way for the Grand Boulevard that would circle the city with four corner parks. This was known as Northwest Park, Northeast Park, now known as Lincoln Park, Southwest Park, Woodson, Southeast, Trosper. And they bought the right-of-way, and for us in government, this would never happen again, they bought all that right-of-way in one year. And so they had the parklands, they had the layout, the survey of the boulevard, a place to get out of the city, out into beauty, a place to plant and to have source of recreation. That very same year, the State Fair of Oklahoma was created. And after a bitter fight, whether it should be in the eastern part of the city or the western part of the city, the eastern faction won the fight and built it at what is now 8th in Martin Luther King, the old side of the old Douglas High School, many of us remember, that was built in 1954. That was the original state fairgrounds. All of this is happening in 1907. And in that year, 
the city decides to invest $3,000 in a greenhouse, the first conservatory at Wheeler Park. It wasn't this one, but it was another greenhouse that was built at Wheeler Park, and they started bringing in plants that could be enjoyed by the public. Fast forward. The city would peak in terms of uh, prosperity and construction and development and investment in 1909-1910, recession of 1911, some tough years, followed by World War I. Spinning out of World War I, the city is looking to reinvest. We're still growing. We've got the packing plants. The oil fields are approaching Oklahoma City. We would discover oil on the southeast side in 1928. All of this was brewing in this city, and we were growing, reinvesting in ourselves again. And in 1923, a challenge hits, a flood. Floods downtown, where the First National Bank is today, there was two foot of water. And it flooded Wheeler Park. Not a good place for a public facility on that river at that spot. So they did a couple of things. They moved the zoo out of Wheeler Park to Northeast Park. It's now the Oklahoma City Zoo. And they moved the old greenhouse to the fairgrounds. People were still going to the fairgrounds in 1923. Streetcar line would go straight out 8th Street and terminate, so people would get on the streetcar system, get out to the fair, a place to enjoy the outdoors. It was still in the river. The North Canadian River would veer to the north on that northeast side of town and cut across the old fairgrounds. And they built that, and uh, the public enjoyed it. We know that in 1924, after that first greenhouse was moved, they ordered a kit from Lord and Burnham. New York City had come from England, specialized in greenhouses. In England, the age of conservation and parks had started 20 or 30 years earlier than it had in America. Lord and, and Burnham came to New York City, specialized in making buildings like this affordable in cities and in individuals. In the city of Oklahoma City, again, had a decision to make, let's expand our greenhouse effort at the old fairgrounds. So they ordered this kit and built it at the old fairgrounds. We know that in 24, there were 100,000 plants on display in those greenhouses at the state fairgrounds. Well, the march of history would carry on problems at the old fairgrounds. One, you had the annual floods because the river cut across that quarter section. The site was too small for a public changing from streetcars to automobiles, no parking. There was development all around it. And then on top of that, it turned out that the Oklahoma City oil field discovered at Southeast 59th and Bryant came north. And the oil field hopped the river and into the fairgrounds in the city that owned the fairgrounds after 1915 decided that, yes, they would like to have that income from oil wells. And so oil wells are drilled on the old fairgrounds, squeezing the available land even more. And so the fairgrounds is suffering. In the meantime, the Great Depression hits, 1929, 1930. The city quits investing in itself for a while. A few projects that happen are done with federal investment, such as City Hall where many of you work, built, uh, funded in 1935, uh, built 1937, along with the municipal auditorium, the county courthouse. That's a reinvestment, but with federal grants coming in. Well, with the federal grants available in the 1930s and the fairground suffering, people make another decision. A city council, the fair board, volunteers say, let's move that Lord and Burnham conservatory out of a declining institution and move it to where more people can enjoy it. And around this old Northwest Park that we now call Will Rogers Park, there were new houses being built at that very time. So this would have been a thriving part of town in the 30s. We could walk down these streets and I would guess most of these build most of these houses are going to be 30s and 40s. So it's where the people are moving. People now have automobiles they can get out. It doesn't have to have a streetcar line out to it. And so this was the natural place to bring this building. And then using federal grants through the CCCs, you see much of the uh, sandstone work around the park would be CCs. That was 
administered through the United States Army. So it got started earlier because it was more direct. You know, it wasn't a block grant to a city or a state. And then along comes WPA, PWA, with block grants to cities. And if the cities will put up the materials, the federal grants will pay for all of the labor. All of this comes together to bring this building to this site. Following the Great Depression, efforts go into World War II. We spin out of World War II with a city that's rapidly changing. Neighborhoods are moving farther out into the suburbs. The interstate highway system really starts taking effect by 1957, 58, 59. People moving out of the inner city, the inner city declining, the impact of urban renewal, reinvesting in ourselves but in different ways, not in our parks, allowing facilities like this to decline, getting back to the point where mediocrity was acceptable in watching buildings deteriorate. And there were efforts to maintain it, but never the amount of money, never the will to say, let's go all in. Let's make sure we save that connection with our own history. Then during the second Great Depression, after 1985, when Penn Square Bank fails, First National Bank fails, property values are a third of what they had been at the peak of the boom. Again, people are not willing to invest, a sense of hopelessness. Well, I don't know if we need to invest because it may not pay dividends. It all turns around in 93 with MAPS. We're about to celebrate the 20th anniversary of MAPS. Doesn't seem like it could be that long ago. And then out of that comes a new sense of renewal that yes, we're worth investing in, that yes, if we work together as a community, we can leave this place better than we found it. And the bond issue idea comes along with a staff that's efficient, high standards, convinces the public that yes, we are worth investing in. The money was there and then the rest of that story. And here we are today, connecting the dots, going back to the turn of the last century. What we have got to make sure is that we do not allow this place to sink back into mediocrity, that we keep investing in our parks, in our quality of life, the things that pull us together, either through our history or through recreation. And if we can do that in our lifetime and make the right decisions at the right moment, seize the opportunities and deal with the challenges, then our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will come along and see those investments. And the next Bob Blackburn in another 50 years will be back here talking about the decisions that many of you made to make this possible. Congratulations.